So how's it going guys? I wanted to talk a little bit about an arc in Dragon Ball Z that is quite hated actually. Very disliked. Maybe hate is a strong word, but a lot of people really seem to have strong feelings about the Garlic Jr. Saga, which is filler. It did not happen in the manga. And if something doesn't happen in the manga, then people seem to always flip their shit in an anime, especially in Dragon Ball Z. People don't like it, they feel like it's a waste of time. This is part of the reason why a series like Dragon Ball Kai was created, in part anyway. But uh, Garlic Jr., you know, I believe is a great character. I very much enjoyed the Dead Zone, so I was very happy uh, watching this saga when I was a teenager. This was uh, pretty epic to me. I was very excited for Dragon Ball Z around this time. They had just wrapped up Season 3, which was the Frieza saga, and everyone knows that old tale if you're an old-school Dragon Ball Z fan like me and you watched the show on Toonami. It taken many a year to get Dragon Ball Z Season 3 dubbed. And it was quite the moment. So we were hot off the heels. Dragon Ball Z was super hot. Everyone was talking about it in school. So it was exciting that Season 4 was just around the corner. But Toonami and Funimation decided to do something a little bit special, something they had not done before really with any other anime. Season 4 starts off, and it's very debatable like what are seasons really when you think about the original show run, but thanks to the DVDs and it being on Toonami, the show was broken up into seasons, even though it really wasn't that way in Japan. But for the sake of uh, argument, this is season four. So while they were dubbing season four, which was quite big, really, I mean, it's made up of 30 something episodes, they figured why not give people the Garlic Jr. saga, which is just nine episodes, and they'll air all of these episodes one by one every Saturday on a special little block that was accompanied with other shows along with Dragon Ball Z, of course, called Toonami The Rising Sun. And this was pretty cool because they had played Dragon Ball Z on Saturday mornings, I believe, on some other channels. I think one time it might have been on the WB. It's kind of hard. There's a mixture of stories online. My recollection isn't really too good about what stations they played this on TV back in the day, but this was Dragon Ball uh, Z on Saturday mornings, along with tons of other great cartoons. You know, now Cartoon Network, who was not really known for their Saturday morning cartoons, was now getting in the mix with Fox Kids and Kids WB, so this was pretty exciting. And I was, I remember that I really liked this saga as a kid, and I enjoyed it even more so uh, watching it again on DVD as an adult, and recently I've went back and I've started watching Dragon Ball Z again because I had just finished watching Dragon Ball on DVD because I just recently bought the DVDs at the beginning of the year after watching that. I was like, okay, it's time to go watch some Dragon Ball Z. And going back to it, I have to say, it really holds up pretty well. And you might be asking yourself, why out of all the sagas did you decide to do a video on this one, Brett? Well, because I figured it's controversial, not a lot of people like it. And I always kind of found that I usually am very fascinated by controversial things when it comes to shows and movies. If you look back, you know, I just did a, a Limp Bizkit uh, review on, on their newest album, and I talked about how things can be controversial and how it really grabs my interest. You know, why do people hate this? You know, is it really warranted to hate? And then you start to really discover and really look at things fair mindedly, and you see, well, things are not as they are perceived by the general public. And, you know, of course, not always everyone 
feels the same way about every episode, every saga, every type of anime, every type of show on TV. But uh, for the most part, most DBZ fans seem like they don't really like this saga. And I think it's a lot of the very vocal minority. Because I remember back in the day when this aired, you know, we were talking about it in school. We liked it. We were pretty happy what we were looking at. You know, we were just happy for new DBZ. Maybe that had something to do with it. But going back now and, you know, we've had Dragon Ball Super. We've had all the movies dubbed and localized. So, you know, now and, and plus all the video games, all that extra content. Going back, I was quite surprised at... You know, just how much I still liked it. And then again, I'm not really too surprised because you like what you like. You might not like something, but I do. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about this saga. Let's go a little bit in depth here and explore why I like it. Well, first of all, Garlic Jr. is back. And I love the Dead Zone and I love Garlic Jr. I always found it kind of crazy that Chuck Huber, who does the voice of Emperor Pilaf, in Dragon Ball, he also does the voice of Garlic Jr. Now, of course, he voiced Garlic Jr. first. They, When they redubbed Dead Zone from the Ocean Group, uh, they used Chuck Huber as well. And I think he's a great voice, and I like him as Pilaf. And the thing is, these characters look the same. I don't know if that was intended when they created Garlic Jr., who was created after Pilaf. But I think it's kind of funny that these two characters are voiced by the same guy. And I think that was kind of why the decision was made. Because they do look similar. And I know you kind of actually look at those two characters. You kind of figure that that's actually how they would both sound. But anyway, if you've watched The Dead Zone, Garlic was trapped in The Dead Zone at the end of it. Thanks to Gohan. And you have the Makio star or uh, the Makio world, as it's referred to in the original Japanese dialogue. And this is Garlic Jr.'s home planet. And every 5,000 years, the planet starts heading towards Earth. And thanks to the proximity of the planet to the Earth, Garlic Jr. is able to harness its powers and break free from the dead zone. But, you know, I gotta go with Makio Star as far as what I think sounds the best. But when you kind of think about it, is it possible to live on a star? I mean, aren't they usually kind of hot? Aren't they usually like millions of degrees? But, uh, you know, I digress there. You know, I'm getting a little silly. But this time he's brought along even stronger henchmen than the last time and they're all aptly named of course because he's garlic you got to have mustard salt vinegar and spice and i guess this was probably due to the fact that one of his henchmen in dead zone was named ginger so the funny thing is in the dub version which is of course my preferred version of watching this show they name this little group the Spice Boys. And the funny thing is, is, you know, none of their names are Spice Girls names. It's obviously a nod to that famous pop girl group from the 90s. And the thing is, uh, the character Ginger is the name of one of the Spice Girls, but that's Dead Zone. And this is the anime after all, but I thought that was actually pretty weird. They kind of missed out on that opportunity. They could have renamed those characters for the dub when you kind of think about it of Dead Zone. But anyway, Garlic's got a new plan. He's back, and if you remember from Dead Zone, he had wished for immortality, and he is still immortal, so he's been spinning around the Dead Zone all that time, pretty much stuck in limbo, and I remember always thinking that the Dead Zone was pretty freaky as a kid, you know, watching this, like, the Dead Zone, just this weird-ass portal that you get sucked into, and once you're in there, there's basically no escape, and Garlic pretty much got lucky, the Macchio star, 
just happened to be close enough where he could use it to escape. And now Garlic has a plan. He is going to now use the Dragon Balls to wish his father back to life. And not only that, he is going to use the Black Water Mist that his father once used and he is going to use that on the people of earth and turn them all into mindless demon slaves and another thing about that Macchio star is doesn't it remind everyone of the big getty star from the return of cooler movie and speaking of the movies this is the first time that a movie character actually got featured in the anime they didn't even do that with a character as popular as cooler now of course you could argue that there was beerus and Whis, you know in dragon ball super but that kind of doesn't count because they were basically rewriting those movies for the anime so that's kind of up for debate. But I think it's really cool they decided to actually bring back a character from the movies, flesh him out more, and give him some showtime. Because I really love Garlic's dialogue in this saga. As I said, Chuck Huber, he's just a great voice actor. And he really shines here, as well as all the Spice Boys do as well. So one of the other great things about this saga is the fact that there's no Goku. Goku's still off in space. He's still training. He still doesn't want to come back to Earth yet. We also see various scenes throughout the saga where Vegeta is searching for him because we saw that at the end of season three that he just hops in Dr. Brief's spaceship and just rockets off into space. And we now see what he's up to. And we see all these really cool scenes of him beating up on Frieza's henchmen that have been left behind on various planets. And it kind of has this eerie, adventurous tone to it. And it kind of breaks up the action that's going on on Earth with Garlic Jr. and the whole plot. There's even this great part where Vegeta thinks he sees Goku. And I'm pretty sure it is Goku. It looks like a figure off in distance. And he has a glow around him. And just as Vegeta starts to approach Goku, a giant asteroid gets in his way. And before he could dispose of it, uh, Goku's already gone. And all we see is a giant crater left behind. And this is, it has that spooky, you know, kind of really mysterious feeling to it. And I really like the feel of a lot of these Vegeta scenes. So you might ask, well, who's going to save the day now? You know, Goku's been saving the day now for uh, for several arcs here. So this time around, it's Gohan, Piccolo, and Krillin. And that's it. It's a three-man team. And that is all you got. Because the other Z fighters are, have all been brainwashed by the Blackwater Mist. You've got Yamcha, Master Roshi... Uh, Tien isn't in on this, and neither is Chaozu, uh, but Oolong and Poir, they also have got infected by the, the mist, and even uh, Chi-Chi as well, which makes for some hilarious scenes, and the other thing is, uh, speaking of hilarious, uh, this is a pretty funny arc, and we're going to talk about the last episode as well in the saga, which is a pure comedy episode, which doesn't really even feel like it's part of this arc because it's such a different tone but we've got Krillin's girlfriend Marin who I think is an excellently drawn character if you know what I mean boys but that's besides the point uh we've got Master Roshi here perving on Krillin's girlfriend and Krillin is really uh, a simp in this you know because he's never had a, a girlfriend before and he's trying to like make her happy and we could kind of see that they're really a terrible match they have like nothing in common at all and what about this scene right here where krillin actually uh, imitates humphrey bogart and gohan actually says that's the worst humphrey bogart impression i ever heard humphrey bogart confirmed canon in the dragon ball universe i don't care what you want to say that that was in the dub but i thought that was hilarious the first time i heard it 
And it's even more hilarious now hearing that again as an adult. I think that was a great line. And, you know, probably some kids watching this were probably really confused. Like, who the hell is Humphrey Bogart? But anyway. And throughout this saga, we really see a lot of glimpses of Dragon Ball. Where there was a lot of comedy. Things were serious in Dragon Ball a lot of the time. But, you know, they did know when to kind of bring it back and and have the comedy and, and have it have this like calming charming feel to it and even though dragon ball z is oozing with charm it's definitely different than how dragon ball was laid out and you got to see a lot of akira toriyama's comedic roots in dragon ball more so than z so here we see a lot of master roshi and what had made him so great in dragon ball as i mentioned with marin You've got Bulma getting pissed at Master Roshi. You have Marin flirting with Yamcha. Marin and Chi Chi also get into a hilarious fight themselves, a verbal one. They don't really touch each other, but Chi Chi almost does. She actually powers up and is ready to kick her ass after she calls her old. And I thought that that was really quite the funny part. There's nothing quite like hearing Chi Chi rage. I just think that that is hilarious to me. I mean, things just have a really goofy, fun, comedic tone to it before the, the darkness becomes realized. And it's all about getting together to have one big party after the whole planet Namek fiasco and Gohan needs to sneak out of the house and Chi Chi doesn't want him to go because he's working on his homework so as you can see there's a light-hearted tone and I really like the juxtaposition because things are about to get a whole lot darker and things are getting dark they just don't realize it yet Krillin and Gohan also leave Marin at Korin's tower and we see Korin and yeah, Jirobi, you know, they're all perving on Marin too, and they're even playing strip poker. It's it's a lot of fun. I mean, it, it's bonkers, and I like that they flash back to Corn Sour because things are really dark in this story, and even though I love that darker tone, it's nice that they keep flipping back and forth, and then you got the things going on with Vegeta. So there's a lot of variety to be had here. They keep things moving, and things are always interesting at all times, and they they even get to be funny as well so overall there's a great sense of variety and none of it takes away from the fact that things are in dire straits on earth also speaking of dragon ball did Korin actually pawn off the power pole goku's weapon of choice in uh the poker game that they were playing with matt and i just found that really hilarious how he just puts it down on the table like it's just uh like a watch or something like that it's like a mystical weapon and it's pretty funny because it's like an afterthought you haven't seen it in so long and like oh there it is it's just being pawned off in a in a poker game there's really good fight scenes in this i really like the idea of this really just being a downsized team it really feels like they're underdogs and they're fighting from underneath the whole time and it takes place on Kami's lookout because Garlic captures Kami and Mr. Popo, shrinks them down, puts them in little jars. The stakes are very high in this saga when you think about it. I mean, Garlic has got them backed into a corner and what else really backs them into a corner is the fact that Piccolo gets bit by Yamcha and Chi Chi and everybody and he T seemingly turns evil but we find out that it's only a ruse and he pretends to bite grill a krillin and we think that he's under the influence of the black war mist as well because just being bit by someone is supposed to be enough to turn you into a demon but this plot device of zombified characters is really fun. We get to see Piccolo do a heel turn momentarily. Seeing Krillin and Piccolo team up and try to batter Gohan is a lot of fun. It adds to the diversity of the fight scenes. And plus, back at Kame House, when we have the scuffle with Master Roshi and Yamcha and Chi-Chi even starts going after Gohan... 
This is always a lot of fun to see them get kind of creative. We see these evil versions of the characters, and I really enjoyed this. I think it, it worked well into the plot and made for some pretty cool action scenes mixed with some comedy as well as Gohan is trying to beg off Chi-Chi from beating him up. And he thinks it's all because he snuck out of the house to go to the party at Kame House. And we see that when Krillin gets really close to Garlic, he manages to snag uh, Kami and Popo from underneath his cloak. And they free them. And then we get this other really interesting part where Kami and Mr. Popo have to take the sacred water into the depths of the lookout and this place is a graveyard yeah they weirdly enough have a graveyard located at the bottom of the lookout and this is where all the former guardians of the earth or kamis you know if you're watching the original japanese this is where they all go when they pass away and we see these eerie cloaked figures and they're standing in Kami's way he's not supposed to be there it's not his time to go to this place and they're basically beating the shit out of him the whole time and I really like the fact that him and Popo are like running away from these guys and it's really desperate because what they're trying to do is they need to bring the sacred water to a certain part within this graveyard and this gives them access to the earth seven air currents and they will pour the sacred water into the air currents and it will spread throughout earth because there's no other way that they could possibly get it out to all the people on earth at the time and some of these scenes on earth are pretty disturbing everyone's got red eyes and sharp snarling teeth there's even this one scene where you know you watch a scene and sometimes it's like kind of violent and kind of eerie at the same time and it kind of gets to you and there's this one scene where you see this couple and somehow they've managed to sort of shelter themselves and get away from the black water mist and they're like they think they're safe but then there's a bunch of cats and rats that just you see their their teeth and and their eyes and they they like jump on top of these people and then the camera cuts away and you just hear their screams of terror and i'm like wow were they just like pretty much uh just torn apart by these animals and i'm like damn i mean that was sort of really violent in the show that we really see a lot of violence but nothing kind of like that where it kind of gets into the horror genre so there's just a creepy vibe throughout this entire saga and that's kind of like what garlic is he's kind of like the horror character he really brings this spooky vibe because he's not really like these other villains we saw like frieza and sell you know this is like a different kind of villain really he has a much different vibe than the others and that's kind of why i really like him so much he feels really original and the fact that there's a lot less of him because he doesn't stick around for very long as we all know this arc is really short he only appears in eight of the episodes in this saga and like i said the last episode he's not even in it also bruce falconer is on fire throughout this saga with this creepy dark music and garlic steam is one of my absolute favorites from falconer's entire dbz library i mean it just has this really creepy downtrodden vibe and you know when you hear this that there's evil abound and one of the coolest parts is gotta be Gohan's performance here because all of the henchmen including Garlic Jr. himself when he eventually transforms and Gohan is dispatching all of them right and left even when Vinegar and Spice transform along with Garlic Jr. there's still no match for Gohan he just blows them away with a double blast with each one of them on either side of him and then we get this great callback to the original dragon ball anime where gohan does his world famous headbutt move and he goes right through garlic jr a la king piccolo just the way his dad did and i thought that that was really poetic it was cool it 
kind of gave a little connection there between Goku and Gohan. And since Goku's not there, Gohan really channeling his dad's determination and drive. So I think that was really very memorable. It's just too bad that Garlic is immortal and that really didn't have any effect on him. And you got this really cool part where you have Gohan using a shield because Krillin has been battered and beaten and Piccolo has as well. He tries his best to try to fight off Garlic Jr. But he's immortal, so he's basically just wasting energy. And plus, Kami is down in the depths of the lookout. So until he comes out, Piccolo is just completely worn out. They have no energy left at all. And Gohan is holding the shield and... Uh, Krillin and Piccolo are both telling Gohan, uh, you know, destroy the Makio star. Just do it already. And that's the source of Garlic Jr.'s power. You hit that and that will be the end of it. But Gohan doesn't want to lose the shield and risk having Krillin and Piccolo get sucked up into the void. So you see the noble cause, but it's sort of like that same thing you felt in the Saiyan Saga, remember where Piccolo's trying to tell Gohan to attack Nappa, but he won't, and you kind of, you know, you like Gohan, I love Gohan personally, but it's like so frustrating, like, could you fucking do something already? You know, you, you kind of feel like that about him. So finally, when Kami re-emerges along with Popo, Piccolo gets his strength back, and then he leaves the shield, and then he still won't he still won't fire a blast at the Macchio star so Krillin to encourage Gohan even further leaves the shield himself to do battle with Garlic Jr and just when it seems like all hope is lost Gohan finally fires a blast destroys the Macchio star Garlic Jr shrivels up like a raisin and he falls into the dead zone and that's the end of that and I just think that that's fucking epic I mean the just the dire straights that the characters are in as i mentioned the stakes are super high and i really love the vibe of this saga it just feels so right and the fact that our heroes managed to do this without the help of goku or vegeta you know mainly goku i mean most of the time when you kind of think about it DBZ and just Dragon Ball in general has been the Goku show and personally I don't really have a problem with that but it was nice to kind of see these characters get uh the spotlight you know Krillin is kind of considered to be one of the weaker characters but he's a fan favorite I love Krillin you know you think of his roots with Goku going back to Dragon Ball but, you know, Krillin has always gotten his ass handed to him on numerous occasions. I mean, even in Dragon Ball. I mean, he's such a lower power level than Goku. It's almost a meme. And Piccolo, you know, they kind of give him one last hurrah on the Cell Saga. But by the time we get to the Majin Buu Saga, Piccolo is sort of irrelevant when it comes to helping out in his power level. Now, thankfully, they kind of rectified that at the end of Dragon Ball Super, kind of returning Piccolo to prominence once again and giving him a purpose, showing that he can hang with the other heroes. But, you know, for this time, it was good to see Piccolo actually have an impact on the proceedings. But, of course, Gohan is really the star of the show overall because he's the one who does all the work. He killed everybody. He looked like a fucking beast here, and I absolutely love it. Now we'll talk about the last episode in the saga, and that's Krillin's proposal. So I talked about Marin and Krillin and you know I I do like her character you know she's ditzy and everything but you you kind of get mad at her because the way she's treating Krillin but at the same time you could be like well Krillin's kind of being a simp and he really is he's buying all these gifts for Marin and you're like kind of thinking to yourself like okay where is he getting the money for all this he doesn't have a job you know th keep in mind he's not a cop yet uh, he wouldn't become a cop until Dragon Ball Super. So it's like, okay, that's a lot of gifts there, pal. A lot of simping going on there, buddy. But uh, this is a really fun, entertaining episode. You know, we see uh, Marin is still flirting with Yamcha, even though they're talking about marriage at this point. And I really love when they 
because she, she goes and looks at a wedding dress and she kind of this is the hint to krillin and i kind of like wh when krillin has this daydream and he's got he looked he has two kids that that look like him and these are supposed to be his children and uh and one of them looks exactly like he did in dragon ball complete with the robe and everything i think that's just fucking hilarious uh, but this episode, when you kind of think about it, it's pretty fluffy, but it has that Dragon Ball feel in a way. It's just like, you know, just fun and relaxing because, you know, the whole Earth just went to shit just one episode ago. So it was nice to kind of be able to sit back after watching those eight episodes and just kind of have a little fun adventure. So it's Turtle's birthday and the and Turtle ends up telling Krillin about this pearl called the mermaid's pearl and it's supposed to be at the bottom of the ocean somewhere near kame house and you know right here it's like okay krillin wants to get this for her and turtle says like this will help the relationship between krillin and and uh and marin so it's like okay so you're supposed to buy her love with a giant pearl okay i'm not really too sure about the messaging there but all right, so Krillin ropes Gohan into this, and they go underwater. They find the Pearl after battling a giant eel, and this is pretty much the only fighting you see for the whole entire episode, which I kind of like. You know, there was minimal fighting, and some people complain, and this is maybe part of the reason why people don't like this arc. Oh, there was no fighting in here. They just fought a giant eel. I'm sure there's someone who probably said that there on the internet. But you kind of like the messaging here because we see that all the giant eel was doing uh, is trying to protect the pearl. We see all these fish just gather up in front of the pearl. And I do like this little uh, analogy that Gohan makes about the Ginyu Force. You know, and if they took the pearl, they'd be like the Ginyu Force being bullies to all the fish down there. And that's not in the original Japanese dialogue. So that's really one of the times where you got to really admit that the dub did a really good job putting that in there. Because, I mean, that sounded pretty good. It sounded really relevant to the situation. And they're supposed to be the heroes. And they wouldn't really look that heroic stealing from a bunch of fish. So uh, this is just a little bit odd in a way when you think about it. Because Krillin just out of the blue, just decides to break it off with Marin. And he says something along the lines of, well, if you if you love someone, you got to let her go. Well, okay, you know, uh, you were just talking about marrying this girl. Now you want to break up with her. And so the, he ends up breaking up with Marin, and sure enough, she runs off with another guy, proving <laughs> that Krillin was a total simp the whole time. And you kind of feel bad for Krillin in a way, but she actually ends up saying to him that she would have said yes, but then she runs off with the guy anyway. I don't know, I just kind of thought, even in the original Japanese, I, I look at the dialogue, I always have it turned on while I'm watching the episode, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense this part. I guess Krillin just kind of looked at the Pearl and felt like, well, if he's got to do all this, he should break it off with her because, like, the love is not real. It doesn't feel genuine. And then we see his eventual relationship with Android 18, and it kind of all comes full circle. So you watch this episode, and then you see what happens with him later on with Android 18. You kind of really start to appreciate Krillin's relationship to Marin and how he kind of really got an upgrade. Uh, whether, you know, you want to talk about physical or not is purely your taste but you know obviously uh android 18 was definitely the better pick for krillin and he actually ended up living happily ever after as we all see in dragon ball super and such but yeah there's some good comedy in here with krillin and i like that the episode is focused on krillin and we get to see more of that classic master roshi perviness and any throwbacks to dragon ball are fine with me and i'm a big roshi fan 
And, uh, I mean, I just absolutely love just whimsical stuff like this, charming stuff. It's kind of why I don't get mad and I don't get mad at filler. Because if you're, if all I ask is that I be entertained. And if I'm entertained and I'm laughing and I'm having a good time, there's no possible way I'm going to rate the episode, at, you know, bad. I just, I can't do it. I'd be lying. So yeah, there you go, guys. So I really do enjoy the Garlic Jr. Saga. So let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Do you enjoy it like I do? Or do you think it's just worthless filler and you really don't enjoy it all that much? I'd love to know. And please subscribe if you haven't already. Click the bell to get all notifications when I post all my new videos. I want to thank all my patrons for your continued support. And thanks again, guys. I'll see you next time.